precisely conditioned as to pressure, but there are no different kinds of particles. All our light waves wound up into particles which are doubly charged. Their position at any one point in their wave causes them to have the electric condition appropriate for that point. Light particles are forever moving in their octave waves. All are either heading toward their cathode or their anode, which means toward vacuity or gravity. They are all moving either inward or outward, spirally. People think our particles are spherical wave structures consisting of an outgoing wave combined with a, an in wave. Mathematicians are fairly happy with this because these are the only two possible solutions of the equations, so that part is okay. Now the center of this structure behaves just like a particle. The only problem is not many people know it yet because not many people have investigated it. The light particles are all the same light particles, all being different only in pressure condition. This is also true of the elements of matter, whether they be iron, carbon, silicon, bismuth, or radium, all are composed of the same kind of light particles. They all seem to have different qualities and attributes, but those qualities and attributes are likewise given to them purely by the positions they occupy in their waves. All things simulate light. Einstein assumed that matter was a spatially extended field. Spherical. Right. So what's the difference between Einstein's view and your view of matter? And what are the similarities? Research in, uh, in energy transfer, in which is what we're talking about when we're talking about forces between particles, Research and, and energy transfer has shown that it is always quantum mechanics which gives the correct description. That is, one particle changes a quantum wave state, and for example, that might be a source, and somewhere, somewhere else, another particle changes its state exactly the opposite way. This one goes down a certain amount of energy, then this one will go up a certain amount of energy. Exactly. That's the conservation of energy. We, we realize that all energy is transferred in this way. Therefore, the only conclusion is that the electric fields are descriptions of large numbers of the quantum transfers. That's so a blending of lots of little energy jumps gives yeah. rise to what appears on a large scale as a very smooth continuous energy exchange. But when we started looking closely enough at one electron in a molecule losing energy to another electron somewhere else, right. we found that it was in bits. Someone this in charge is what Max Planck did in 1900, didn't they? Yeah. Planck discovered this. A single particle all by itself doesn't do very much. But if you take two particles, a proton and an electron, and you put them together, they, their waves join. And their waves join uh, with certain rules. Electron waves will form patterns. The violinist uh, knows that there's patterns inside that violin case. So, in the same way, these patterns form between particles. Helium is more complex than hydrogen, or you combine uh, a hydrogen with an oxygen, then you get very, very, very complex arrangements. 
and of course every chemist and a biologist knows these arrangements as the atomic table. Any exchange in one of these complex wave structures can only happen if it goes to one wave structure to another wave structure. It can't go halfway between because the wave structures have to be like waves on a string. You have a violin string, you pluck it, always has the same note. That is, the waves on it are a pattern. A certain frequency of a standing wave. Yeah, it's just what they call a standing wave. Uh, the kids wave a, a jump rope up and down. It has always a, a fixed pattern. Well, the, the wave patterns of atoms and molecules have fixed patterns. When an energy changes, it changes moving from one pattern to another pattern. And only certain are allowed, and that explains why and only certain, only certain energy yeah. states are allowed. Okay. People ask me, uh, why did you become a physicist? The fact of the matter is, I never wanted to become a physicist. I uh, wanted to be a fix-up man. When the Large Hadron Collider and its massive detectors become operational in 2007, one of its primary tasks will be to look for the Higgs boson. Although formulated by several theorists, it takes its name from one of its proponents, Professor Peter Higgs of Edinburgh University, who today leads a quiet life in an old area of Edinburgh known as Newtown. As he walks each day near his home, this leading field theorist passes the house of a revered predecessor. This house we're standing outside is the, the birthplace of James Clark Maxwell. It's a reminder to me of the, the way field theory began in the 19th century. As a pupil of Cotton School in Bristol, he excelled in mathematics. And then he became aware of a famous old boy of the school, the theoretical physicist Paul Dirac. The name Paul Dirac appeared rather frequently in the, the school honours board at the back of the platform in the assembly hall. So I got curious about what Paul Dirac did. <laughs> it, it very soon became evident when I was a physics undergraduate that I was not going to be an experimental physicist. Uh, I, I was terrible as an experimentalist at King's College London where I was an undergraduate. They'd introduced a theoretical option. Uh, so uh, I gladly took that. <laughs> and it was as a theoretical physicist that Peter Higgs encountered theories by the Japanese-American physicist Yoshiro Nambu that seemed to point the way to understanding particle masses. In the version of the, this type of theory which <coughs> which I formulated in 1964, which uh, brought in uh, fields like Maxwell's electromagnetism, fields of this type, uh, in addition to giving mass to the fermions, the uh, quanta of the electromagnetic type of field acquired mass too. This is what has been given the name the Higgs mechanism, though it was actually uh, written down a little earlier by <coughs> uh, Brout and Onglair in Brussels. And <coughs> the generation of mass there is, is the, uh, the same kind of thing as uh, in Nambu's uh, papers, but it, it is now uh, working for uh, particles of spin one, which are the quanta of the electromagnetic type of field, they change from being particles which travel with the velocity of light to particles which travel with anything less than the velocity of light, and that's the massiveness. Much of these new ideas center on the rethinking of the nature of a vacuum. When you look at the vacuum in a quantum theory of fields, it isn't exactly nothing. The, it, the vacuum state is the state of lowest possible energy. And again, as in the original classical idea, it's what you have left when you pump everything you can out of your system. Now, everything you can pump out is all the particles. 
but you don't necessarily get rid of everything. There can be uh, residual fields which remain as a background in this vacuum. So the vacuum is no longer quite as empty as it used to be. It's the interaction between this field, now known as the Higgs field, and particles that's at the centre of his thinking. The relation to particles is that in these theories, the, uh, this background uh, could be deformable. It could be excited by interaction with other things. Uh, the excitations take the form classically of, of travelling waves and so on. But this is quantum mechanics, not classical mechanics. Every time you have uh, uh, travelling waves, uh, the energy and momentum come in lumps. And in the case of the Higgs field, these lumps are the Higgs bosons that the LHC is preparing to look for. What's intriguing about these Higgs bosons and their source field is that they appear to confer mass on particles. The way that the background field generates mass is rather like the way in which when light passes through a transparent medium like glass or water, it gets slowed down. It no longer travels with the fundamental velocity of light, C. And uh, that's the way to think, think of the generation of, of mass, because in, in a uh, quantum field theory, all the other particles are also excitations of various kinds of fields, which you can describe by classical waves. Now, these waves travel through this background field. And the way they travel in terms of the relation between frequency and, and wavelength is altered by the background field, or may be altered. If they interact with the background field, it alters the so-called dispersion relation between frequency and wavelength. Now, when it comes to the particles, which are the uh, associated with those other fields, uh, you, you, you take the uh, frequency multiply by Planck's constant, you take the inverse of the wavelength, multiply by Planck's constant, the one gives you the energy of a particle, the other gives you the momentum of a particle. And so altering the frequency wavelength relation of the waves propagating through the Higgs field alters the uh, energy momentum relation for the particles and therefore alters the mass. The problem is explaining the considerable variation of mass between different particles. In theories of this type, most of that variation is attributed to variation in the strength of the interaction of, of the particles with the Higgs field. Now, that's not really uh, uh, any explanation. It's, it's simply uh, saying there is a connection between uh, the mass that the particle has and the extent to which it inter interacts with the Higgs field. The LHC's detectors will look for hard evidence that it is these interactions with the Higgs field carried by Higgs bosons that are responsible for mass. As a theoretician, of course, I, 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 I find the, uh, the mathematical structure of this kind of, of theory uh, very satisfying. Uh, but on the other hand, if it's not verified experimentally, it, well, it's just a game. It, ha it, it has to be put to the test. Uh, at the present time, the interesting thing is that the uh, electroweak theory of Glashauer, Weinberg and Salam, which was the successful application of these ideas, has been r r rather th thoroughly tested uh, quantitatively for, for most of the relationships that, that, that are built into it in, in the course particularly of the running of LEP. Now given that th that has been done, uh, it would be r rather surprising to me if the underlying idea was, was not right. If the Higgs boson exists, the LHC will have the power to detect it. That's assuming the theory is correct. In 1993, the then Minister for Science, William de Grey, offered a bottle of vintage champagne to anyone who could explain the Higgs boson in simple terms. Nature does not 
has not two different ways of creating anything. Created only by waves. There's nothing in the nature but waves of motion. Waves multiply in the direction of their amplitude and they divide on the way down. Back to silence of the of the zero from which it came. That's life and death. All you have to do is look up into the heavens and look at a spiral galaxy, and you'll see the exact same formation. In fact, every every nucleal center is not exactly uh, a solid mass. There's only only one instance in the wave in which that's actually true, and that's at carbon, or what we call the wave amplitude. It's where the if you imagine a sinusoid, it's where the crest and the trough uh, is located. At that position you've accumulated maximum potential by compression from the outside to the inside. And so it isn't a nuclear uh, mass in the way that they teach it, where all elements have a nuclear mass full of protons and neutrons of a certain weight with orbital electrons around it. What Russell is really endeavoring to teach us is that there's a wave structure behind all so-called particles or particulate. A particle mass is really only an accumulation of uh, waves in a smaller volume or smaller region of space. And so it, it, based on all of our test equipment and what we have available to us to our limited senses, it appears to be a particle mass. And that's what led to this whole, this whole explosion of trying to describe everything using uh, particles. But in reality, it's it's the underlying mechanics behind everything is waves. Everything has a wave structure because everything is created and it lives. It has a life and death cycle. And that is fundamentally based upon the structure of the wave. Yes. So in and in the wave, of course, when things are, are moving through in waves and in wave fields, you constantly have this um, this balance, right? And the balance, if I if I understand it correctly, the balance in nature uh, is like moving through, or well, this is a big question too, motion. But if, for for all intents and purposes, I'll say moving through um, fields of space. So is that what we would call like a a, a field perturbation? In theories of this type, most of that variation is attributed to variation in the strength of the interaction of, of the particles with the Higgs field. Now, that's not really uh, uh, any explanation. It's, it's simply uh, saying there is a connection between uh, the mass that the particle has and the extent to which it inter interacts with the Higgs field. The LHC's detectors will look for hard evidence that it is these interactions with the Higgs field carried by Higgs bosons that are responsible for mass. As a theoretician, of course, I, 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 I find the, uh, the mathematical structure of this kind of, of theory uh, very satisfying. Uh, but on the other hand, if it's not verified experimentally, it, well, it's just a game. It, ha it, it has to be put to the test. Uh, at the present time, the interesting thing is that the uh, electroweak theory of Glashow, Weinberg, and Salam, which was the successful application of these ideas, has been r r rather th thoroughly tested uh, quantitatively for, for most of the relationships that, that, that are built into it in, in the course particularly of the running of LEP. Now, given that th that has been done, uh, it would be r rather surprising to me if the underlying idea was, was not right. If the Higgs boson exists, the LHC will have the power to detect it. That's assuming the theory is correct. The theory fits 
the data in a crude way to about 10% accuracy if you, uh, if you just do a, what's almost a back of the envelope calculation from the original equations. But then you have to do corrections to this first approximation. And into the corrections, the so-called loop, one loop corrections, come the masses of all the particles that are in the theory that maybe you haven't yet discovered. Now, during the, the running of LEP, they pinned down the masses of everything, I think, except the top quark. In 1995, Fermilab found the top quark and produced a, a, an a, a approximate mass for it. And that enabled people to look at this correction formula and say, okay, what's, what's left to fill the gap between theory and experiment? Uh, that's the Higgs boson contribution. Therefore, the Higgs boson mass should be in a certain range. Uh, in 1995, the pr prediction was a rather interesting one. It was that the most likely values were within reach of LEP, uh, around about uh, en energy 95 or 90 or so uh, JEV, and LEP went up beyond that. Uh, LEP went up to 114 and didn't find anything. And this was maybe a bit worrying because uh, they were beginning to get to the tail of the st statistical distribution. Uh, but in the last few months, uh, new measurements uh, f reported by Fermilab have revised the mass of the top quark and that favored value, the most, most likely value for the Higgs boson mass, is about 117. Now that's tantalizingly close to what the people at LEP thought they might have found. It's not a free parameter of the theory. We know that trillions of tons per cc is not an adjustable parameter at this point, because we've measured, it's measured. What can we say? Nature does not, has not two different ways of creating anything. Only by waves. There's nothing in the nature but waves of motion. Waves multiply in the direction of their amplitude and they divide on the way down. Back to silence of the of the zero from which it came. That's life and death. And the resurrection on the other side of the equator when the same a note of the offspring reproduces itself again as another a note. They're so fast we think of them as continuous. But they're so fast. But there's a black gap of silence between each one of those. Every time it passes the, the zero no point of plane of silence from which it has appeared, it silence again, and it appears on the other side, the same siren tones accumulate, multiply into the A tone of the, the giraffe. So it is as well. And so fast we think of them as continuous. But they're so fast. But there's a black gap of silence between each one of those. Every time it passes the, the zero no point plane of silence from which it has appeared, it silence again, and it appears on the other side, the same siren tones accumulate, multiply into the A tone of the, the giraffe, and so it is as well. <laughs>
Knowledge is solely an attribute of the mind. Sensation is solely an attribute of the body. Mind is static light, the one and only power source of this universe. Thus thinking, you see what man calls life in a new light. You see it as the manner in which God manifests the idea of light and eternal life by dividing his one idea into countless pairs of many seemingly separate ideas, for that is what vibrating light waves are. These waves of light emerge from their fulcrum zeros and disappear into them in endless repetitions forever and ever. The wave is an extension of heaven to earth and back again. The wave is a projection from the spiritual universe of rest to a resting point in the physical universe and back again to the spiritual universe for renewal of power to repeat the journey. Another way of saying it is that the wave is an emergence from the static condition of rest through the dynamic condition of motion to the static condition and back again, or that it is an extension of cause through effect and back again through effect to cause. Between every pulsation of movement, there is a period of stillness, which divides every compression expansion sequence. You can knowingly say that the power expressed in motion is not really in the motion, but is in the stillness, which divides motion. If that is true, life itself, which is presumed to be motion, must have its source in eternal rest. If death is presumed to be non-motion and life is dependent upon it to express life, the only possible conclusion is that life is two ways, both of which have their source in rest. The time will come in the unfoldment of man when his inner sensory perception will equal his outer sensory perception. When that time comes, he will know that motion only seems but has no existence. Present day man senses do not permit him to perceive the simultaneously voiding motion which cancels out the one they do see. In our new science of tomorrow teachings are these words for a new law for tomorrow which read, every action reaction in nature is voided as it occurs, is recorded as it's voided and is repeated as it is recorded. The time has come when unfolding man should recognize this fact and place knowledge and power in the creator of universal bodies and not in the bodies. So with this incredible amount of knowledge entering into human consciousness, it becomes obvious that a major change for humankind is being birthed. For thousands of years spiritual information was kept secret. Priests and priestesses of various religions or cults would give their lives to keep the rest of the world from knowing about one of their secret documents or piece of spiritual knowledge, making sure it remained secret. All the various spiritual groups and religions around the world had their secret information. Then suddenly, in the mid-sixties, the veil of secrecy was lifted. In unison, 
Almost all the spiritual groups of the world opened their archives at the same moment in history. You can browse through books in your neighborhood bookstore and see information that has been sealed and guarded for thousands of years. Why? Why now? Life on this planet is accelerating faster and faster and faster, obviously culminating in something new and different, perhaps just out of the reach of our normal imagination. We are always changing. What does this mean for the world? Why is it happening? Better yet, why is it happening now? Why didn't it happen a thousand years ago? Or why didn't it wait to happen 100, 1000 or 10,000 years from now? It's really important to understand the answer to this question, because if you don't know why this is happening now, then you probably will not understand what's happening to you in your life or be prepared for the coming changes. It would certainly be very puzzling for, for, for me to, to, to think of a situation where somebody could really r rule out the existence of the Higgs, Higgs boson because uh, there, there it is. It, so, it, I mean, it, well, there it is. The, the the theory and the experiment are uh, working very well to, together in all other respects. So, where do you go from there? <laughs>
and lessening because of the taking of the tree growth down and of the destruction of the oxygen in the atmosphere that makes it necessary to pull more and more and more oxygen from the earth for its necessity and not succeeded in doing lowers it, raises the temperature of the earth. The unborn water is water that is is being released from the crystal structures like the granite and the silicon. The artesian water is that which has already come out and, and circulating in the atmosphere to the clouds and back again. Please explain briefly what you mean by the term extending the fulcrum. In my understanding, the fulcrum is the span that supports the seesaw. Do you mean by extension to make it higher? Or do you mean to make the seesaw lower, longer? I mean to make the extension a fulcrum of the seesaw. The fulcrum is there in nature always. The moment you express a desire to do something to make an action, then you extend from the fulcrum both ways. You make the seesaw. That's what it is, is to extend it to the amount of energy that you have. If you do not extend the fulcrum, you seemingly extend it. You seemingly divide its power. Because either boy or children on either end of the seesaw can express the power of motion. But that is all they do, express the power of motion. And that power of motion they express is the power borrowed from the stillness of the fulcrum at the center. I do not always have to like to say it's a seeming extension because the universe is only seeming. Perhaps if I use the word, it's a thought extension. And it is. It's an imagined extension. In your thinking, you imagine. And you cannot imagine without... You cannot imagine uh, objectively without creating emotion objectively in your imagining. And so it is in the thinking process of nature there seems to be an extension or division which takes power or borrows seeming power without borrowing it but seeming to before I say it. The extension of power is like a person pulling away from the falcon with an elastic band that stretches and strains and makes it harder and harder and harder to pull away from it. But on the opposite side, as equal pulling, pulling away to balance that pulling. But the power is in the fulcrum, not in the heat. For if a man, if, for instance, if, you, if you stood out on the prairie and pulled at a rope, you have no difficulty in pulling at that rope. It does not pull you back. But you hit your post there, and the post does not move. And you take an elastic band, and you hitch it to it. And you stretch away from it. You find it pulling back. Therefore, you've created two conditions at the same time. You've created condition of extension, condition of extension, and condition of expansion. And of, uh, uh, of retraction. That's the action and reaction nature. From the zero, you have extended in every direction, because you cannot extend this direction from the fulcrum without extending in the opposite direction to balance it. The two conditions of concentration and concentration of mental thinking have been established in, a, in what we call an electric current. 
If you let that master go, it will go back to where it started from and disappear in the Falcon. That Falcon is the zero. That which we borrowed from the Falcon is a multiplication of that zero plus and minus. One balancing the other, one offsetting the other. You borrow 50 from here, from there, by your pulling. 50 plus. On the opposite side of that is a 50 minus. 50 minus and 50 plus total together a zero. Nothing in nature ever exceeds zero. It seems to. And so we have a multiplied and multiple, multiplying and dividing universe into pairs of opposite conditions of compression and expansion two opposite pressures which make the test possible to run our engines and do all the things we have and run the engine of our heartbeat and so forth. But the fulcrum of every never extension, every cease our motion, the fulcrum never moves. That is if zero and the elastic bands will pull together and disappear into the light from which it came, into the zero light from which it came to divide itself into two lights that will illumine the bodies that have extended corners. Those lights illumine and warm and heat and cool the bodies that are extended from it to make a universe like that. To make a universe that fits the imaginings of your mind. When it retracts back to that, there's no more want to want the bodies, no more light to light the body. The imagined universe disappears in so far as that one desire is concerned. Life has appeared and disappeared in death, and it will again reappear. The extension of the fulcrum and its multiplication to a point of equal potential to that which is borrowed from the fulcrum is right, with all of the effects that is created by so doing, the effects of warmth and heat and cool and growth and decay and moisture that make up this universe. And when that elastic band pulls that back into the bosom, there's an absolute disappearance of all it. The whole universe can't disappear at once because it isn't created that way. But that one that one pulsation will, will disappear and the pulsations which appear by extending the fulcrum and retracting those pulsations begin with an incredible speed, with an incredibly small duration, frequencies of millions and millions of extensions and retractions. The seesaw extent will be retracting so that its frequency is 186,000 miles a second. The frequency is growing larger, duration, accumulating, accumulating time until the frequencies are so slow that it gives you one in 15 years of a tree, perhaps. The ant, the elephant, the sun, the solar system. Multiplied time, multiplied frequency, multiplied ability to accumulate these frequencies and wind them up to retard time for the sake of multiplying power. That's the level principle. That's the fulcrum in level principle. Shorten the lever. 
you lose time in the game park. A man by shortening the lever sufficiently and getting on the long end of it can lift tons. Well, without that lever, he could only lift 100, 150 pounds with the lever and pulse of his own body. He's limited to that, but with the, as our committee said, give me a fulcrum and a lever long enough and I could move the universe. It's true. Does light bring spontaneous from nature? The college professor said it did not. Um, there is nothing spontaneous in nature in the sense that it is used. Everything in nature is planned. Everything in nature is the result of a desire to become, a desire to express in motion the idea of mind. Nothing spontaneous happens in your kitchen. In motion, the idea of mind. Nothing spontaneous happens in your kitchen after the dinner dishes have gone there. <laughs> A desire to reassort them is followed by action. And the fulfillment of your desire takes place by action. A word spontaneous is used often in the, na in the relation of combustion, spontaneous combustion. You leave a pile of refuse out somewhere and some kindlings in it or, or even some decaying vegetation in earth that will burst into flame. That's not spontaneous combustion. That's the result of accumulated power accumulated the power of decay. Baby universe, nine octaves. Gases begin the first octave, very dense metals end the ninth octave, like the plutonium being the last of the natural last of the natural elements. So you have very few rings with gases. You'll start at hydrogen, one electron or whatever. They call it an electron. There's no such thing, but it's more of a ring. And that ring, of, um, I kind of think, like to use these words. There's a protonic force of inward motion or compression, a neutronic force, which is a point of reversal, and then an electronic force, which is the point of, of expansion back to stillness. So stillness compresses to a point and then expands in a reversal of direction back out to stillness. There's a protonic force of inward motion or compression, a neutronic force, which is a point of reversal, and then an electronic force, which is the point of, of expansion back to stillness. So stillness compresses to a point and then expands in a reversal of direction back out to stillness. And the way you can look at that too in, in nature is the breath. You breathe in, you start at zero, you breathe in, you stop at zero reverse direction and exhale out to do it again. 
So Walter's primary law is balance. If you need two words, rhythmic balance. If you need three words, rhythmic balance to interchange. And basically what that is is a series of repetitions that repeats eternally. So you have removed the need for the Big Bang. And this is basically a mind wave universe that rotates on the still white magnetic light. Anywhere you look, the center of any object is a point of gravity. Gravity is not an inward pulling force in Russell science. It is stillness which divides into the north and south shaft upon which motion then rotates. So wherever there is a center of gravity, there is motion surrounding it. And that center of gravity can be likened to God. It's, it's the same thing in creation. Gravity and God are one in that sense. There's nothing in the nature but waves of motion. Waves multiply in the direction of their amplitude and they divide on the way down. In fact, the silence of the, of the zero from which it came. That's life and death. The Universal Octave. The heartbeat of the universe starting from zero of rest spirals from its minimum to its maximum and back again to zero in four pairs of opposite actions and reactions. These four pairs of opposite electric interweavers constitute the universal spiral octave wave by means of which the dynamic universe of effect rises from the static universe of cause. Figure 67. The octave wave formula which governs all motion and its birth position in the universal wave is as follows in figure 68. Figure 68 is the two-way journey from zero through zero to zero. Zero to four means the centripetal direction toward the apex of the spiral, which leads to higher potential, density, gravity, and the white heat of incandescence. Four to zero means the centrifugal direction toward the base of the spiral which leads to lower pressure, lower potential, vacuity, radiativity, and the black cold of space. Each of these is half of a cycle. The reason an octave cannot be counted from 1 to 8 instead of from 1 to 4 is because each of the pressures which bear the relations of 1 to 4 positive in the octave is a credit pressure which has its equal opposite debit pressure in 1 to 4 negative. The elements of matter born on the spiral pairs of opposites as tones have the same relation as tones of music have to the octave wave. All wave motion is expressed in eight tones, four pairs of opposites. The middle pair is seemingly one. The octave is usually expressed as seven for this reason. An octave is a series of orderly harmonic tones. Tones are multiplied in divided pressures of light, spaced rhythmically with mathematical precision upon each octave wave of motion. The law which applies to one effect of motion applies to all, whether sound wave, electric current, color spectrum, or octaves of elements of matter. No state of motion has permanence or even duration. Everything is forever in a state of transition, changing its position in its wave by either multiplying or dividing its vibration frequencies to change its conditioning. The basis of all octaves is the keynote of rest from which the octave springs to express the idea which lies within the magnetic stillness of that keynote. The fulcrum of the wave of musical octaves is its keynote from which all tonal changes in the octave are mathematically calculated in wave frequencies and volume. That keynote is always in one's consciousness whether the note is being sounded or not. It is the balance of its octave. All tones are out of balance with it at all times and forever desire balance. No state of motion can evade the keynote of rest from which it sprang nor can it be separated from it electrically in matter or consciously in mind. 
No matter what instrument produces octave tones, its frequencies and other dimensions must be in the orderliness demanded by the opening and closing spiral pairs, which control those tones by conditioning them. Likewise, no matter what the instrument, whether larynx of man, string of violin, carbon wave field, or color spectrum, its sole motivating power for producing change of dimensions for the purpose of producing change of tone is electric pressure directed by desire and borrowed from the keynote of the octave's stillness. Furthermore, all power thus borrowed from one expression in any octave tone must be in balance with the opposite of that tone within which those borrowings have been debited. This outstanding fact of natural law must be borne in mind in considering those principles as applied to the mechanics of the universal wave which produces the octave wave tones of the elements of matter with such precision that any effect produced by any of them in combination or separately will produce that same effect always. The elements of matter. An invariable characteristic of nature is to express life-death cycles of any idea in nine lesser interweaving cycles enfolded in the one. When we think of man as an idea, we think of him as grown up to fullness of middle age. Until then, we think of generating man as infant, child, and youth. Following his generating cycles come the degenerative ones in which he gradually repays all of his borrowings from his zero of rest and returns to that zero to again borrow power to re-express the idea of man, figure 71. This process of nature, which expresses its cycles of idea in nine lesser cycles, is conspicuously present in the life-death cycles of the elements of matter. Carbon alone expresses the idea of matter. All the nine octaves of the elements are stages of unfoldment and refoldment of carbon. The first four and a half octaves lead to the maturity of carbon by the generative contraction of gravity. It is the hardest of all the other stages of its transition, having the highest melting point. The last four and a half octaves lead from maturity through old age to disappearance at the end of the nine octave cycle by the radiative expansion of vacuity, figure 70. Genero activity begins at the birth of carbon in the first octave with genero active inner explosive speed of light, which is 186,400 miles per second. It ends with an equal radioactive outer explosive speed. This speed is the limit at which motion can reproduce itself in curved wave fields before reaching zero where motion and curvature cease. Carbon fulfills the plan of the creator in his desire to create but one form, the cube sphere. Carbon alone crystallizes in true cube, with all of the qualities of the true cube and sphere fully exemplified. All other elements which crystallize as cubes are octave extensions of carbon. All such extensions occupy the 404 position of wave amplitude. In carbon are all of the elements of its previous stages, just as in man are all the actions and reactions of his previous stages. Hydrogen is a one-octave younger prototype of carbon. It forms on the wave amplitude at 404, just as carbon forms at 404 one octave ahead. In hydrogen is a whole octave of elemental tones. Several of these have been recently discovered and wrongly named isotopes. Isotopes are split tones, such as those which a violinist could produce between full tones. An amazing thing happens at this point in the unfolding of carbon's life record. Hydrogen's melting point is 259 degrees below zero centigrade, and in one octave, the winding up process of nature acts like a whiplash at its halfway position, where generoactivity and radioactivity meet as equals. This effect tightens the winding of carbon into such a dense substance that the melting point jumps to 3,600 degrees above zero in that one octave. Nature immediately counterbalances this accelerative action by dropping nitrogen, the next element beyond carbon, into a gas which melts at 210 degrees below zero centigrade. It does not recover from the gaseous condition during the rest of its octave. 
The cosmic seed of the carbon octave is helium. Silicon is one octave older than carbon. The melting point of silicon drops to less than one half of its younger stage, 1420 degrees. The cosmic seed of the silicon octave is neon. When carbon becomes still another octave older at the 404 position of cobalt in the sixth octave, it divides its full tone into ten split isotope tones, five on either side, figure 70. Carbon at this stage has lost much of its vitality and changes its character by thus dividing it into cobalt isotopes. Its melting point has dropped to 1480 degrees, which is slightly higher than the silicon stage of carbon. Because of sharing that position with ten others, it has lost much of its true cube-sphere quality of balance, which the 404 position manifests. The evidence of that is the metallic quality of cobalt, which would be impossible in the true cube sphere position of 404 in the octave wave. The 404 position is one of balance between the pairs of metallic opposites, such as iron and nickel, manganese and copper, chromium and zinc, or sodium and chlorine. When any of these pairs lose their metallic quality, such as iron and oxygen and iron rust, or sodium and chlorine in sodium chloride, they find both rest and balance in the stony quality of the salts. They crystallize in the cubic system if they are equal or near equal opposite pairs. Sodium chloride is a good example. One can see its approximately true cubes in sodium chloride, ordinary table salt, or in the distorted cube crystals of sodium iodide. The 404 position in the octaves of the elements is the position of rest, where any action must end its half cycle and begin its other half. It comes to a point of rest before returning to a point of rest, as all actions and reactions in nature do. At one octave of still further aging, carbon becomes rhodium and again climbs to its amplitude position at 404, by five efforts and descends by five more. Rhodium is more vital than cobalt, for its melting point is 1950 degrees, figure 70. The cosmic seed of rhodium octave is krypton. Great vitality is often evidenced in nature's creations after they have fully matured. The radioactive death principle is as vital in disintegrating the body as generoactive principle is in integrating it. That vitality is enhanced by the opposition of the generoactive resistance set up against it. Such strong vital metals as silver, nickel, copper, tantalum, tungsten, osmium, platinum, and gold belong to the aging half cycles of carbon. Tantalum is a radioactive metal which becomes so dense because of opposition between the two electric conditioners that its melting point reaches 3400 degrees centigrade or within 200 degrees of carbon. Osmium follows with a melting point of 2700 degrees and platinum at 1755 degrees. In this octave, the violent drop from carbon's melting point to nitrogen's melting point at minus 210 is balanced by this corresponding generoactive reaction. In the next octave of carbon's aging, the radioactive death principle becomes more evident in lutetium. After reaching its three position in the positive half of its octave, it arrives at its balance position of 404 only after making 13 efforts, as evidenced by 13 isotopes including unknowns. These are balanced by 13 in the negative half cycle. Among these 13 is the vital tungsten, a negative metal of great commercial value. By bombarding this metal with a sufficiently high current to cause it to disintegrate, it will discharge its seed of inert cosmic gases, just as an oak tree will discharge its cosmic seed in acorns. The cosmic seed of the lutetium octave is xenon. The cosmic seed of carbon's last octave of disappearance arises from the inert gas nitron. Octaves unfold from their past recorded seed and they must have a seed into which their present record can refold. That principle is absolute in nature. Radium and actinium evidence the going to seed process of all completed cycles of growing things. 
in a strong measure. One can see this process taking place in radium without resorting to the electrocution process referred to as applied to tungsten. A small telescopic instrument, the spintheroscope, contains a needle upon which a microscopic portion of radium has been placed in front of a fluorescent screen. By looking through its lenses in the dark, one can see the shedding of the cosmic seed of the slowly dying carbon in its radium stage as the rays of those cosmic seeds bombard the screen. The effect is beautiful, like looking into the heavens on a starry night with all of its stars twinkling into appearance and disappearance, as fireflies twinkle in the meadow on a dark night. Carbon never comes within perception at tomium, but its efforts to reach tomium are evidenced in the uranium group of isotopes, of which there are 15 before tomium is reached. Out of this group, several have been found and made use of, especially those from which the atom bomb has been produced, figure 70. Radioactivity has so nearly reached its maximum at this point that the speed of the cosmic seed shed by these isotopes has been measured at 180,000 miles per second, which is approximately the speed of light nearing its ending point at Tomion, where the octave again begins at Alphanon. The inert gases. The octaves of the elements of matter grow from seed, just as all things grow from seed. From the moment the elements unfold from their seed, they are in a constant state of transition from the beginning of their cycle to the end. Elements are not fixed, created things. They are pressure conditions of light waves. Those conditions of light pressures are constantly changing from infancy to old age in the elements of matter, just as they are in the animal kingdom. The inert gases are cosmic elements which will not combine with any other elements. They constitute the recording system of this creating universe. They surround the zero from which motion springs and to which it returns. They represent minimum motion in the wave, just as amplitudes represent maximum motion. They are the seeds of the octaves of matter, and each octave has a different seed, just as different trees have different seeds. Elements are waves, and waves disappear and reappear. God's recording system does not allow any creating thing to disappear without recording the actions and reactions of its stages of appearance. All states of motion are recorded in the inert gases. In the inert gases are the souls of their bodily manifestations in the universe of motion. In them is desire for expression, and the pattern form of that desire. The cosmic inert gases fill all space between the stars of heaven. They insulate the states of motion from each other by their balancing zero. They bring all motion into being through the will of the Creator, true to the pattern of desire. They are the source of balancing cosmic rays which interchange between zero and matter. They vitalize matter with the omnipotence of creative desire which lies within the zero of these cosmic rays. There are nine cosmic gases, the first and the last being one. Alphanon begins the cycle and ends it. There is no beginning and no ending. The list of cosmic gases follows. Alphanon, Betanon, Gammonon, Helium, Neon, Argon, Krypton, Xenon, and Niton. Spectrum Analysis the known octaves which lie within the range of perception are five and one-half. These begin with the third or hydrogen octave and end with the uranium group which are isotopes of actinium and tomium in the last octave. The invisible octaves of finely divided matter of space are three and one-half in number. These octaves are beyond our range of perception but they are not beyond our knowing. Light is the universal language. Through spectrum analysis of light waves, man has been able to analyze and recognize each element when in its incandescent stage. By means of the spectroscope, he has been enabled to divide light rays through its prisms into the component parts which make up the life history of each stage of its two-way cycle. Each element tells the story of its entire previous incarnations in other octaves since its beginning. Any line in one octave is repeated in the next, but shifted in position because of the changing pressures of each succeeding octave. The spectrum of hydrogen is preponderantly red. 
a bright red line indicates its present octave. Other red lines tell its past history in lower octaves. The simple history of hydrogen, as compared to the complex spectrum of iron, is like the history of an obscure youth as compared to that of Napoleon. In the spectrum analysis of iron, the lines which belong to iron and those which tell its recent and remote history can be seen at a glance. These lines also indicate the relative ability of the iron atom to charge or discharge. Wavelength 7181.8 is immediately recognizable as belonging to iron in its present octave. 6916.8 is recent history and 6944.8 is extremely remote history. Herein follows a partial list of lines whose wavelengths belong to iron or to its immediate mid-tone associates and also other lists indicating its recent and its more remote history. And it has a diagram belonging to iron, recent history, remote history. So you guys can see that I will include this at the end. The visible and invisible spectrum is divided into several thousand lines. Each line is different in its shade of color and in its plane. Each line proves that this universe of varying motion is a universe of varying pressures. Atomic structure. The elements of matter are not different substances or different things. They are different pressure conditions of light waves. The light units of the elements are all alike, but are differently conditioned by the electric pressures exerted upon them during the inward or outward spiral journey from zero to zero. The unanswered mystery of how the elements become mathematically precise octave tones, just as musical tones or color tones of the spectrum are mathematically precise in vibration orderliness, lies in the wave field gyroscopic principle. Together, the eight elements of an octave form two halves of one whole cycle of tones, which ascend from 0 to 4, 0, 4 position of amplitude and then descend again to 0 to begin anew. This spiral journey contracts into greater pressures as it approaches wave field amplitude positions at spiral apices and expands into lower ones on the return journey to spiral bases. That two-way spiral journey of each half cycle extends between six mirrors of still light, which compose the wave field, and wind around a still shaft, which centers the spiral. Three of these mirrors are the mirrors of action, and three are the mirrors of reaction, figure 75. The three of action are the inner intersection planes of the cube, and the three of reaction are the outer boundary planes of the wave field. All of these planes of the wave field are of zero curvature, but the spiral universe which is forming within those planes is curved. Curved planes of light act as two-way lenses which bend light to focal points and extend it from those focal points radially. As the two-way spirals of forming matter extend from the wave field center in opposite directions toward wave field intersections, the six mirror planes of still light focus three points of still light upon the still shaft of each half cycle. Centers are formed at these focal points which become the one, two, three positive and negative elements of matter by rotating gyroscopically around the wheels of light which act as equators for those borning tones. Multiplying and dividing pressures determine the density and volume of each succeeding element. The color spectrum records these pressures as the complete history of every element from octave to octave of the whole nine octave cycle of the elements. Multiplying pressures of the spiral also affect the curvature of its light lenses to such an extent that the focusing positions change their mathematical ratios in conformity with the acceleration of gravity and the deceleration of radiation. The positions of focal centers of gyroscopic wheels upon the wave shaft are thus affected as diagrammed in figure 76 and figure 72. Each element is the square of the distance to and from its succeeding one in accordance with its direction. The direction of gravity is the inverse square and the opposite direction is the direct square. The volume of each succeeding element is likewise affected directly and inversely as the cube. Six of the eight gyroscopic wheels of the whole octave 
are thus accounted for by geometric projection of two-way opposed lights through each other from two sets of three mirror boundary fields. The fourth double tone is formed at the rest point where eight cube wave fields meet. This is the point of rest, which is known as the center of gravity in Earth's or Sun's, where motion and curvature cease. The complete sphere thus becomes a section of eight adjoining wave fields and revolves around that point of rest upon the wave shaft where the two half cycles of the wave meet. For this reason, the 404 position is one of balance, in which the yellow of orange is the dominating color of one of its two gyroscopic wheels, and the yellow of green is the other, centered by white. At the two points upon the still shaft of the turning sphere, where the shaft penetrates its surface are the magnetic poles of still light, which control the balance of each sphere's turning. One of these is the north magnetic pole, which controls the winding of the sphere into density by centripetal electric force, and the other is the south magnetic pole, which controls its unwinding centrifugally into space. In a sphere such as our nearly mature sun, these magnetic poles are practically upon the sun's poles of rotation, but upon oblating planets, such as our Earth, the magnetic poles are removed from that pole of rotation in accordance with the measure of the Earth's oblateness. The elements of matter are miniature stellar systems. Every principle and law which applies to one applies to the other. This solar system is a gyroscopic wheel in the position which iron occupies in the elemental series. When it spirals a little further, it will correspond to a carbon atom. The sun will then be a true sphere, and its new planets will also be true spheres. The gyroscopic principle accounts for that law of nature, which causes like elements to seek each other. All decomposing components are sorted out, element by element, gyroscopically. The efforts of man to transmute one element into another must be governed by this principle, and not upon the theory that another substance will be obtained by knocking out one electron. It makes no difference how many planets there are in a solar or atomic system, insofar as its substance as an element is concerned. One or more added or subtracted would not change the element into another substance, any more than one or more children would affect the nationality of their parents. Transmutation will become simplified by observing that the plane of gyration in relation to amplitude and the speed of revolution of the gyroscopic wheel upon its still shaft will alone change volume by either multiplying or dividing density. Great possibilities in new metals lie in the proper application of this principle. The shape of the universe. This ageless universe has no shape. It has a seeming infinite extension, but that extension is a reflected one. This electric universe of two-way extended light is but a series of mirrors which reflect into each other through curved lenses. Its seeming extension might be likened to a light within a mirror-bound room. One light within such a mirrored enclosure would seemingly extend infinitely, but the light thus mirrored would be the same light. The reflected extension would have no reality. The idea of continuity or discontinuity is based upon mirrored effect of an initial cause. Continuity in first time. Time is but one of the effects which constitutes this universe. Time flows two ways, but the senses detect only the forward flow. They cannot detect the backward flow which cancels out the forward flow. Time is as unreal as the wave universe is unreal. What is true in principle of one wave is true of all waves. Each wave is a two-way reflected extension of an equilibrium zero, which we call a vibration. Vibrations appear, disappear, and reappear from their source of rest to manifest idea which is existent alone in rest. Just as the vibration of one wave disappears into its zero of universal stillness, so do all vibrations disappear into the universal zero of stillness. This zero universe of vibrating waves can have no shape other than a seeming one. The voiding principle. This is a zero universe of seeming mechanical motion of force exerted in a seeming three-dimensional universe. Every action of any nature begins with zero. 
counts up to 9 to end and begin again at 0. Beyond 9, it cannot go, but up to 9, it must go. 9 is universal. 9 is universal because it is the wave field number, the 8 of the cube centered by the zero of gravity in the sphere. Our decimal system is based upon the wave field of the cube sphere. It is as follows. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, equals 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The musical scale and the spectrum of nature correspond to the wave field tones. They are as follows. Musical, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Tones, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, Rest, Sol, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. Spectrum, Black, Red, Red, Orange, Yellow, White, Yellow, Green, Blue, Blue, Black. Underneath it's the black and red, it's got violet on either end. Figure 75 demonstrates this fact. The three centering planes are centered by zero. All intersections of these planes add up to eight. Eight centered by their zero source equals nine. Likewise, the cube itself adds up to eight by counting the intersections of its six faces. Also, there are eight directions of action and eight of reaction each eight being four pairs, which are nine by adding the centering zero. Nine is the three times three of length, breadth, and height extended from zero. The length, breadth, and height of any expression is two extended zeros centered by zero. Figure two, page 219. Length and breadth are static, for they are both on equipotential levels. Height is dynamic for its radial. The universal nine of matter in space is three mirrors of rest, centered by rest, from which all three extend at right angles to each other, each mirroring itself into the other. Figure 75. The universal nine of the octave is four pairs of opposite pressures extending diagonally from zero, which centers the cube to eight zeros, which corner the cube. Figure 75. The measure of extension from zero to zero is desire for extension. Desire for extension from zero to zero is energy in zero. Energy extended from zero to zero is manifested by pressures of desire equally multiplied and divided, equally added and subtracted, equally credited and debited, and equally and oppositely conditioned. The sum of all these balanced effects is zero. Figure 75. Zero pressures equally multiplied and divided are manifested by the action and reaction of motion. Motion is a projection of the opposed energy pressures of desire from within a centering zero to the extended mirrors of rest, which measure desire and mirror it back to rest in the centering zero as expressed desire. The sum of dually reflected motion thus expressed is zero. Zero thus extended by action to fulfill desire for expression and simultaneously mirrored back to manifest the fulfillment of expressed desire is all there is to this universe of rest. Zero multiplied or divided, added or subtracted, extended or retracted, results in zero. This is a zero universe in all effects of motion, a seeming universe in time and sequence, and a mirage of universe of imaged forms. It is a universe of two negations which simultaneously cancel each other and sequentially repeat the canceling of their negations to create the illusion that zero can be multiplied or divided or added to or subtracted from to create a reality which never is nor can become. Figure 75. That is what creation is. It is the imagining of knowing. Knowing is light. Light is still. Imagining is thinking. Thinking is the imagined action and reaction of motion mirrored from zero of rest to zero of rest. This is a still universe of the light of knowing. In it is no activity. But what about our senses? Our senses tell us otherwise. Our senses are inadequate. They deceive us mightily, and that is good. If the senses could but see the whole, there would be no play. 
The senses record motion alone, for the senses themselves are but motion. Motion is an illusion which only seems, it has no being. The senses do not know, but man believes that his senses do know, and in that belief lies man's confusion. The senses, being but motion, sense moving things and moving light mirrored as moving things. They sense the forward movement of an airplane piling up compression ahead of it, but they do not record the mirrored invisible counterpart of that plane, equal to it in potential and speed, moving backward into a vacuum behind the plane, which simultaneously voids the compression ahead of it. This inadequacy of the senses to record the backward flow of forward moving things causes the illusions of sequence and of time. In figure 77 this principle, diagram by arrows extending two ways from every element in the whole known series, indicates that integration is simultaneously balanced by disintegration. No time interval elapses between the debiting of any credit extended to opposites in nature. Figure 78 diagrams all matters as pairs of opposite conditions. Each line is connected with its opposite mate. Each of the pair is a negation of the other one. Each pair is conditioned as the two tanks of air in figure 18 and the storage battery in figure 19 on page 231 are conditioned. Each one of these elemental pairs is an equal and opposite mirrored extension from a centering zero fulcrum. The fulcrum of all effect is the one light of God. God alone is in man and in all things. Every action is voided as it occurs, is repeated as it is voided, and recorded as and it, it looks is like repeated from the Divine that's Iliad. It. There's some notes, but obviously I'm missing something because it talks about pages 200 and something. So I don't know if I'll be able to find that or not, but I shall give it a try because there might be something good there. Does it say what page this is? Yeah, it talks about all the way to page after, uh, we're gonna see page 280, page 279, and all that I have. How far did I go? All right, this might be it, I don't know. That principle is absolute in nature. Radium and actin, <laughs> oh my goodness. Mm. Okay. And it looks like that's it. There's some notes, but obviously I'm missing something because it talks about pages 200 and something. So, I don't know if I'll be able to find that or not, but I shall give it a try, because there might be something good there. Does it say what page this is? Yeah, it talks about all the way to page after, uh, we're gonna see page 280, page 279, and all that I have. How far did I go? All right. This might be it. I don't know. All right. This might be it. I don't know. I thank you guys for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. Leave me a comment. Let me know if there's another public domain book that you'd like to hear me read. I love to learn. I love to read. Take care till next time. Light is all there is in the spiritual universe of knowing, and simulation of that light in opposite extensions is all there is in the electric wave universe of sensing. 
The simulation of light in matter is not light. There is no light in matter. Perhaps the confusion which attends this idea would be lessened if we classify everything concerning the spiritual universe such as life, intelligence, truth, power, knowledge, and balance as being the one light of knowing, and everything concerning matter and motion as being the two simulated lights of thinking. Thinking expresses knowing in matter, but matter does not think, nor does it know. Thinking also expresses life, truth, idea, power, and balance by recording the ideas of those qualities in the two lights of matter in motion. But matter does not live, nor is it truth, balance, or idea even though it simulates those spiritual qualities. Man's confusion concerning this differentiation lies in his long assumption of the reality of matter, his assumption that his body is his self, that his knowledge is in his brain, and that he lives and dies because his body integrates and disintegrates, has been so fundamental a part of his thinking that it is difficult for him to reverse his thinking to the fact that matter is but motion and has no reality beyond simulating reality. The light which we think we see is but motion. We do not see light. We feel the wave vibrations set up by the motion which simulates light. But the motion of electric waves which simulate light is not that which it simulates. Confusion concerning light corpuscles. There is much confusion concerning the many kinds of particles of matter such as electrons, protons, photons, neutrons, and others. These many particles are supposedly different because of the belief that some are negatively charged, some are positively charged, and some are so equally charged that one supposedly neutralizes the other. There is no such condition in nature as negative charge, nor are there negatively charged particles. Charge and discharge are opposite conditions, as filling and emptying, or compressing and expanding, are opposite conditions. Compressing bodies are charging into higher potential conditions. Conversely, expanding bodies are discharging into lower potential conditions. To describe an electron as a negatively charged body is equivalent to saying that it is an expanding, contracting body. Contracting and expanding bodies move in opposite directions contracting bodies more radially inward toward mass centers and expanding bodies more radially outward toward space which surrounds masses. In this two-way universe, light which is inwardly directed toward gravity charges mass and discharges space. When directed toward space, it charges space and discharges mass. All direction of force in nature is spiral. The charging condition is positive. It multiplies speed of motion into density of substance. The principle of multiplication of motion because of decrease of volume is the cause of the acceleration of gravity. The discharging condition is negative. It divides speed of motion into tenuity of substance. The principle of the division of motion because of expansion of volume is the cause of the deceleration of radiation. One can better comprehend this principle by knowing that what we call substance is purely motion Motion simulates substance by its variations of pressures, its speed, and its gyroscopic relation to its wave axis.